so we're looking at uh, lesson three on the lesson, uh, and we're on number five, and we're looking at under the, the uh, giving a soft answer, and we want to remind ourselves here that we're talking about the uh, two responses that people give when we have uh, pro when we're provoked by people who are in a superior position to us or in an equal position to us. And that would be to either have a quiet a response, no answer, or to have a soft answer. And those are our two choices. Those are the two things that meekness will teach us to do, to either be quiet or to, uh, to guard our mouths and to be quiet altogether or to give a soft answer in response. And so we're under the number five, under letter B, to give a soft answer. And we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 16. Now, as we go to Proverbs 16, I'll remind you where we finished. We described last week the difference between uh, Gideon's response to the Ephraimites and Jephthah's response to the Ephraimites. Now Gideon had uh, a problem with them and so did Jephthah. When Gideon had a problem with the Ephraimites he gave a soft answer, he humbled himself in front of them and their anger was turned away. When Jephthah responded, he responded with vicious words and hard words and it caused 42,000 people to end up dead. And so those are the two types of responses. So who was the greater man? Jephthah did just conquer the Ephraimites. He did uh, uh, win that battle. But who was the greater man? Here, Proverbs 16, and we'll look in verse 32. It says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So according to the Bible, who got the greater honor? Well, let's, you can see from this passage what great honor Gideon brought upon himself with his response. You see that? With his response. He brought it upon himself with just with his response. Jephthah brought honor <coughs> to himself in a military victory with his sword. Gideon brought honor to himself with his response without blood being shed. And so, according to the Bible, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. The man who can conquer his spirit and rule it is better than the man who can take a city. That's a powerful thought, a powerful statement. We think of the mighty men, such as Alexander the Great. We think of mighty men, uh, that have, such as Nebuchadnezzar, who went through and conquered. And yet... The Bible says a man who can rule a spirit is greater than that. So here we find um, Gideon got the greater honor. Meekness is represented also in Jacob's conduct toward his brother Esau. We're talking about this uh, tender, gentle response. It is hard to win an offended brother, is it not? Is it hard to win an offended brother? It was accomplished in this situation through God by faith and prayer. When it, through, on, on God's end, he accomplished it through faith and prayer, and with Esau, by meekness and humility. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 32, and we will see this. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32 and you may recall the story of uh, Jacob meeting his brother Esau and it says in verse 1 and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him and when Jacob saw them he said this is God's host and he called the name of that place Mahanaim and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir the country of Edom 
And then he goes on, and he says, how he commanded them, saying, Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban. And he goes on to speak about um, his humility and how he's just come before him uh, to humble himself. He says, If I have found grace in thy sight. He wants to find grace in the sight of Esau, his brother. Look at that humility. And turn over to chapter 34. And uh, we find that, um, let's see, I'm not going to have my, my verse come out of that passage, but the important thing is that uh, uh, Jacob speaks comfortably to Esau and his anger is turned away. Uh, let's look in verse, uh, chapter 33, I believe that's my verse, chapter 33, verse 4. And it says, And Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. They wept. Why, Esau's uh, <coughs> anger was turned aside from Jacob. Praise God, Esau had a soft heart towards Jacob. Jacob could have come at him and said, Well, this is your fault, and uh, you deserved it, and you despised your birthright, and you didn't want it anyway. And he could have said a lot of things. But the way he came at Esau caused Esau to be very comfortable towards him and very forgiving, and they were they, they loved each other as brothers again. So the last verse, I mean no, number seven here in our notes, our soft answer must be humble and submissive. Humble. We have to have a humble response. We must be ready to acknowledge our error and not to stand in it or insist upon our own vindication. We must be ready to acknowledge our error. Do you know how many uh, arguments would be averted if we would acknowledge our error? You know, a lot of times you have an error when somebody else has the greater error. A lot of times someone else has the greater error and your error is a small error compared to theirs, maybe in something insignificant, and yet there's error in your part. And if we would acknowledge our error, we would smooth over things a lot better. It's hard for us to admit our error, right? It's hard for us to see our own faults. It's hard for us to see our mistakes. It's hard for us to see when we're the ones who have done anything wrong to hurt somebody else, especially when the other person is way more wrong than us. And let's be honest, whenever there's an argument between two people and one of them's you, the other person's usually wrong. Isn't that correct? <laughs> the other person's usually the one that's in the greater error. Isn't that right? Well, it would do us good to search ourselves to be able to find some error rather than stand in that error. It do us good to find out what that error is on our part because probably the other person thinks the same way as you do. That you're in the wrong, that you've made the mistake, and that your way is not right, and there's this, and therefore, let's have an open heart and an open mind about it. A submissive spirit, a humble spirit, not insisting on our way, not insisting on being vindicated, but having a meek and quiet spirit about things. So that's the end of the notes for this, this handout that we have. So we're going to start a new handout today. And so let me pull that out. This is the, uh, the second part. I believe there's three parts to these notes that we put together. Dr. Sean, I'll let you pass some of those out. And... at this point that I did not print out my teacher's copy, which is a bad thing. Not having the teacher's copy means I have no none of the notes that you have with the emphasis on the underlines, but I do actually have the notes, I just don't have the blanks, so I'm going to double up. I made sure to print your copy, that's important. I just need to find in here. Thank goodness that Courtney stole my notes last week, or I wouldn't have any notes today, because I made an extra copy. Let's see, i got to find where we are.
Okay. Got it. And we are ready to roll. Part two, the nature of quietness of spirit. We had the first part on the nature of meekness. Now we have the nature of quietness of spirit. And uh, I wonder if I can even give you a little heads up on what the third part is. The excellency of meekness. There's another section and it's the excellency of it. We're going to go through more of the Bible and you'll find how far meekness has its uh, roots in all of Christian spirit, all of the Christianity that we practice. Meekness is everywhere in it. But let's look here at the nature of quietness of spirit. And uh, the verse here is printed out, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever. Notice that Quietness and assurance is the effect of righteousness in Isaiah 32, 17. Isaiah 32, 17, it is the effect. You know, a lot of times we try to, <clears throat> what we say, give people assurance. Uh, giving people assurance is not something that you can do. You can lead them to it, but it is an effect of righteousness. It's an effect. That means that you can't give it to anybody. It's an effect of something that the God gives to them. You can help them to understand it. You can help them to discern it from the scriptures, but you can't assure anyone of their salvation because you don't know if they're saved. You can only show them what the Bible says and let the righteousness that God's put in their hearts be in a, have the effect in assurance. So you, they can see that they're, they are in the, the Word of God. They are in the Scripture. There's what happened to them. They can see it. So we don't give people assurance. We can simply direct them to know their Bibles. And the Bible, uh, the, the righteousness God has given them will be a, give them assurance, but also quietness. Quietness is an effect of righteousness. Quietness is the evenness and composure and the rest of the soul. The soul needs its rest. Quietness is a rest for the soul, which speaks both of the nature and of the excellency of the grace of meekness. It is a grace that God gives to us because we need the work of God upon our hearts and lives. We need the work of God to make us into what we need to be. Quietness of spirit is the soul's Stillness. Stillness. It's the soul's stillness and silence from intending to provoke anyone. You know, we need to be careful that we don't intend to provoke someone. It is easy to get our spirits uh, worked up and in a disquieted fashion intend to provoke somebody <coughs> by the thing that we're about to do. Or resenting provocation from anyone. So we're resenting provocation from people because sometimes people provoke us on purpose, do they not? Sometimes people intentionally do things to make us mad. We've ha we all, it's happened to everyone. If you drive, it's happened to you. Uh, if you've uh, been around human beings, it's happened to you. That is the truth, right? And so we see that people will provoke us. It is the rest to which meekness brings us and is reflective of the God of peace. It's reflective. It's a, re it's a reflection of the God of peace. A reflection. God's image reflecting off of us is quietness. God's image. It's a reflection of the God of peace. It is the love of peace, as Jesus describes in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall... Uh, for they shall be called the children of God. It is a reflection of the God of peace. What a blessing to have quietness. The word quietness is somewhat of a metaphor. And these four metaphors best describe this grace. We're going to go through four metaphors and see what, uh, how, how quietness is reflected and, and best taught by these metaphors. Uh, the first one is that we must be quiet as the air is quiet from the winds as the air is quiet from the winds. We can open our Bibles to Isaiah 7. Isaiah chapter 7. As the air is quiet from the winds, that's how we're to be quiet. And 
And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of the people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. You see that? The, the heart of the people were moved as with the wind. As though the wind had blown them. Their spirits were moved. Quietness of spirit is that stillness, like when the stillness of the breeze stops blowing in the air. A brisk wind is good when harnessed in a sail. A brisk wind is good when harnessed in a sail. And it takes us to the desired haven. You take a sail on a sailboat and you have a little wind, and you harness that wind, that's good. That's a good thing. It is not good to be indifferent to the wind and lay upon the sea with no sail, stuck indefinitely. To be on the sea with no wind is dangerous because you will not go anywhere. So we need wind. We need it harnessed to <coughs> sail. Wind is good. However, tempests are perilous to the traveler. Tempests, storms, those raging winds, those are dangerous to every traveler on the sea. And so are passions and good men. When good men have great passions, it rises up into a place of danger for them. They both hazard the voyage and hinder the ship. Here is your danger. The danger of strong winds, gusty winds in the soul. If we will but use the authority of God, as the authority God has given us over our own hearts, we may keep the winds of passion under the command of religion and reason. The winds of passion under the command of religion and reason. See, we have to keep our hearts still and the meekness that God gives to us helps us to do that. We don't want our hearts blown and bowed by the wind of all the passions in our heart. All the things that rise up, we don't want to be tossed about because of that. We need to be able to have our souls stilled and quieted uh, and to have um, the ability to harness the wind like that sail harnesses the wind. He who allows the winds of passion to take hold is allowing his lust to prevail. His lusts. See, we are going to allow your lust to prevail by allowing the winds of passion to grab hold of you and push you this way and push you that way. You don't want to be having been blown about by the wind, but to be in control of your passions. That is a scriptural and godly place to be. Don't let your lust prevail. Let's go over to James chapter 4. This will be our last passage for today. James chapter 4. Don't let those passions take hold. We don't want lust to get the upper hand. Chapter 4, verse 1. From whence do come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts? that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and ye war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Here is that lust. Get in hold. And what does it do? It's causing wars and turmoils and troubles and fights. That is something that we must avoid with that quietness. If the Bible says you have not because ye ask not. If we ask for this quietness, we will receive from God. If we ask for this kind of quietness, we will receive from God. It is an effect of righteousness forever. Therefore, quietness is a reflection of God Himself. You want to be sure that when your temper is examined by not only your own self, by God and by the world, by people who see you, they see God. They see the reflection of Jesus Christ on your life. That's why it's important to have quietness of spirit so people can see that you are like Christ, that you walk as He walked. 
because our Lord was not discomforted, not discomfited, not uh, um, disoriented in his thinking, not blown about by passions. He was under control of his spirit. Isn't that, isn't that the case? Jesus was under control in his spirit. He did not get angry and sin. And therefore, we want to have, be a reflection of the same Savior. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we're very thankful for uh, this idea, this grace of meekness and quietness. Lord, help us to be able to have stillness of soul, calm under, under pressure, Though the winds blow, Lord, may we harness them for Jesus' sake. Be a reflection of the God of peace. And I pray these, Lord, that you would bless us with a good and godly spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.